Greetings, everyone. This is Peter Colon with the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, and it is my uh, pleasure and privilege to share with you uh, the daily temple psalms that were sung uh, when the temple was still present in Jerusalem so many, many, many years ago. So we're going to start off uh, by uh, starting uh, saying this. If you ever visited a traditional weekday morning synagogue service, uh, you most likely will hear uh, something like this in the beginning. Today is the first day of the week on which the Levites used to recite in the temple. Or if you went on another day, it would be this is the second day of the week or the third day or fourth day. They would start off remembering those specific psalms that were sung at the temple when the temple was still standing here. Uh, this is how our Jewish friends uh, recall the ancient temple worship at that time. Now, if you look at the photo there of the temple and you see the, that uh, monumental stairway there of 15 steps, uh, along with the singing of the 15 psalms that the Levite would do as they stand on those steps playing their instruments and singing Psalms 120 to 134, those are the psalms that are called the Psalms of the Ascent, the Aliyah, the going up. Uh, they also would sing uh, one particular psalm that was designated for each of the days of the week uh, uh, during the morning service at that time there. Now, the Levites would begin singing uh, the, uh, the psalms with no less than 12 uh, voices, uh, mingling with the young voices of the sons of the, of the Levites. Uh, you know, they would join them as well. And they would sing, and uh, I found in my research that the uh, the fathers, the older crowd, were a little bit intimidated by these young voices because of their high uh, voice uh, that that they were able to sing, and it's oftentimes uh, drowning out the older crowd there. But nevertheless, they welcomed them there. They would sing. Uh, and the whole design was to uh, worship the Lord. Uh, now, the psalms of the day, the specific psalms that we're going to be looking at. Uh, were sung in sections. At the close of the singing and the music, after the morning daily uh, sacrifices, there would be three blasts from silver trumpets in which then the people would bow down and they would worship. Uh, and then they would continue with the, uh, the service of the time. Now, there was a different set of Psalms that were designated uh, during the first temple, the temple of uh, you know Solomon and on there, and then by this time frame, uh, the second temple period, there was a different set of psalms that were selected. How they were selected, no one knows. It's a mystery. One is not sure, but perhaps the meaning that was known at the time was lost uh, when the uh, temple, the second temple, was destroyed by the Romans in AD seventy. Nevertheless, by tradition, these psalms still hold, and uh, they're significant, and that's what we're going to look at uh, today. Now, like all the features in the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament, like sac sacrifices, the festivals, the psalms, they are all messianic. Uh, they all spoke of some aspect of the Messiah that would come, what he would say, what they he would do, uh, and then also connected with the Messiah, the messianic age, the, the kingdom that was anticipated to come. So that was what these uh, uh, items that you read in the Hebrew scripture all pointed to. This is something that the ancient rabbis, the sages, always uh, uh, mentioned and reinforced when they would teach that they are to always uh, think in terms of the Messianic age and the person of the Messiah that was to come. And so many of the rabbis say that the Psalms that are sung today, uh, uh, you know, at the synagogues that were part of the temple worship, uh, all spoke about the Messiah. So let's get started. We're going to look at the first one here, and that is on Sunday. And the Psalm that was selected was Psalm 24. Now, I'm just going to designate a few verses uh, to focus on a few items uh, that are, you know, listed there for our consideration. Now, Psalm 24 uh, was composed uh, by David, either when he purchased the threshing floor that was to be the site of the temple, or when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Jerusalem. And... Uh, 
and there was worship there, of course, with that aspect there. Uh, but uh, but the main intent of the song was first to really, in a sense, to dedicate the temple, the very presence of God in the midst of his people. And so one of the verses that I've looked at here in Psalm 24 for our consideration is the question, who is the king of glory? Who is the king of glory? Now, we're going to look at the New Testament in the person of Jesus, who uh, was the Messiah. And, uh, and then selecting those portions as it relates to the psalm that would have been sung on Sunday, uh, as all the psalms that we'll be looking at, each one uh, per the day here. Now, Pontius Pilate, who was the, uh, the official Roman governor, uh, had asked Jesus when he was interrogating him and said, Art thou the king of the Jews? In other words, what Pilate was inquiring was, Jesus, are you here to challenge uh, Caesar's throne, his rulership? And so then Jesus gave Pilate a specific answer, and that's what we want to consider here. He said these words to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, thou sayest that I'm a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And so that's what Jesus said. Now, of course, Pilate uh, ends this interrogation uh, with a very sarcastic uh, question. What is truth? What is truth? Now, a Jewish believer by the, doctor, uh, by the name of Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum wrote an excellent book on the Messiah. And uh, he said, and he was sharing the difference uh, in terms of understanding the kingdom. And, uh, and I thought it was quite excellent. He said that there's a difference between the term of this world and in this world. He said that believers are in the world, but not of the world, as recorded in John chapter 17, verse 16. To be of the world means to be this world, be part of this world's nature, and believers are no longer of this world's nature. When Jesus returns to earth, he will, de he will not depose Caesar and sit upon his throne. Rather, he will come with his own throne, and his own throne, the throne of David, and with his own kingdom, the messianic kingdom. So, when you kind of put this all together, Psalm 24 and the question, you know, uh, you know, the king, the king of glory, Jesus is the king of truth and he is the king of glory. So there's something to consider there when we look at the Sunday Psalm, Psalm 24. Let's look at the Monday Psalm. Psalm 48 is what is normally uh, sung on this day. Now, the rabbis usually associate this song as belonging to the times of the Messiah. Again, as I earlier said, that they're all in reference to the Messiah or his kingdom to be established. Now, Israel is connected. The nation of Israel is connected with the glory of God and with the temple that he dwelt. The holy place where the Ark of the Covenant uh, reflected God's greatness in his presence among his people. And so Psalm 48 kind of focuses on the 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 genuine glory of uh, of God and then also of the city that He had chosen, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Psalm forty eight is a praise song and it commemorates the Lord. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of His holiness. Now we read in John chapter one verse one through fourteen. Oh, Verse one, we have this uh, phrase here that the Apostle John opened up his, his gospel with. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It is very significant that this psalm was sung in the temple while the priests were pouring out the drink offering uh, that was part of the ritual uh, that was done uh, at this time. And so there's an interesting application here. At the Last Supper, when Jesus picked up the cup of wine and said, 
This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. The pouring out of the drink offering in the temple was a metaphor of the blood of Jesus that was literally spilled at the cross. Because it re we read in John chapter 19, verse 34, but when one of the soldiers pierced the side of Jesus while he was on the cross, immediately blood and water came out. And so this became a fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, that the Messiah would be pierced. The main significance of the mentioning of the blood and the water was not simply to state a, a medical uh, observation, but rather to establish a theological testimony that when Jesus was on that cross, he literally died. He did not faint. He did not swoon, but that he literally died on that cross and that his death provided the gift of eternal life to all who simply believe on him, that he had willingly did that for your sins and mine. So Psalm 48 um, is a great psalm showing the glory of God and the city, Jerusalem. That's why Jesus had always said that he needed to be in Jerusalem to do the work that he had come to do. And so Psalm 48. Let's look and move on to Tuesday. And let's consider Psalm 82, uh, according to the ancients. Uh, psalm 82 was written to instruct people uh, who who are in power, such as kings and prince and judges and, and various civil magistrates, uh, to demand on them to judge properly and to support the weak and the poor rather than favoring the, the rich and the powerful. That's what Psalm 82 was kind of focusing on here. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, the psalmist says. Sila, think about that. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Now, during the Feast of Tabernacles, when Jesus was uh, observing it there, or was attending it in John chapter 7, 8, and 9, uh, he rebuked uh, the, uh, the temple officials, uh, officials there. And when he said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment here. Now let's consider a particular incident that incident that uh, some people find controversy and say, oh, it never happened. It's not to be included in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, then it's important and it was meant to be so. It's found in John chapter 8 verses 2 through 11. This is the occasion where the religious leaders uh, wanted to challenge Jesus concerning the Mosaic law. And they brought this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And so we read, starting in verse 2 of, Acts, of John chapter 8, And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came with him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, to Jesus, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had heard them not. So when they continue asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those that are the accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. Can you imagine just being there and witnessing and seeing that whole incident that took place? Now, the focus here is not so much on what he wrote. That seems to be given a lot of attention. What did he actually write there? 
that's not really a sense that is the focus, but rather the attention is his finger, his finger. Because you see, the religious leaders knew that the Mosaic law was written by the finger of God on stone tablets. This is what we read in the book of Exodus, chapter 31, verse 18. They also knew a specific prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 18, which states, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. I think they understood the, the significance of the gesture of just Jesus, just scribbling, right? Whatever he was doing with his finger on the ground there. They saw that they were the ones that had forsaken the Lord and tempting him. So we read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, that Jesus rightly referred to that particular generation that he was in as evil and adulterous, he said. So why did Jesus come? They failed to appreciate what we what is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 17, which says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So that's Psalm 82, the Tuesday Psalm. I mean, there's so many wonderful things that one can draw, but I just thought it would be significant just to focus on what uh, uh, Jesus had said and done and at the time when he was here. So now let's move on and go to Wednesday. This is Psalm 94. Now this is one of the troubling Psalms that many Jewish folks have a hard time reciting. According to tradition now, uh, when the invading Babylonians uh, entered the temple in the year 586 BC, the Levites suddenly began to sing this song. Okay, they, it, that, Some historians don't think that the Babylonians actually came on a Wednesday. Uh, they might have came another day of the week. But nevertheless, the tradition says that uh, when the Levites saw that the Babylonians were coming into the temple, uh, they went immediately to Psalm 94, the Wednesday song. And as the Levites were closing in verse 23 of the psalm, which states, the Lord our God shall cut them off, uh, they were unable to sing it because they suddenly realized what was happening to them was a judgment from God, as recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 14, because of their sins because of the people whom they've led astray and the people who led themselves astray. And they knew that what was happening, this the, the Babylonians coming in, that this was a judgment from God. So they couldn't close out as a whole oh, Lord, cut them off. You know, They were recognizing that they deserve what was happening here to them. So as a result, you could imagine why many Jewish folks in their religious services uh, really don't like singing this song, uh, Psalm 94 on Wednesday, uh, something that just brings back a, a, a bad time of their, of, their time, of their history. But let's consider now another time when God's judgment came upon Jerusalem, and that was in the year AD 70. It was about 40 years after Jesus had come. He had warned that such a time would come. And so we read that they gathered themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemned the innocent blood. Psalm 94, verse 21. Now, what was the judgment here? What had happened? Well, we know that the religious leaders had the authority to determine whether Jesus was the Messiah or not. That's why Jesus was always buying for their, their answer. He would send people whom he had healed and to go to the religious leaders that they would exam and see the miracles that had taken place that he alone had performed and it was all designed so that they would make an official ruling because god was working through the leadership that he had so decreed and created uh for the people of israel and they kept buying and they kept you know just changing uh, you know they just really didn't come out officially and said anything but eventually they did and so there was three reasons why god then brought judgment upon the city of Jerusalem in the year AD 70, why he allowed the legions of Rome to sack it, destroy it. And since that time, there has been no temple present in Jerusalem at this time here. Now, one thing I want to make very clear here, that the judgment that came 
was to that generation of Jesus' day, of that period there. It wasn't something that was to carry on even to now here that God is judging uh, the Jewish people. And, and, you know, they, they, there are some people that are just very cruel and evil and misguided in making such an assertion here. But the judgment that came in AD 70 was focused on that particular generation. And there were three uh, aspects to that. First of all, they attributed the person of Jesus, who, of course, uh, we believe that he is the Messiah. They attributed that Jesus was satanic. In Mark chapter 3, verse 22, it says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, which was the, the idol that the Philistines used to worship here. And by the prince of devils cast he out devils. So what he was doing in terms of his miracles, doing those, those, uh, those works that was solely the prerogative of God, uh, that they were saying it, attributing it to Satan. So that was one facet for the judgment that came upon them. The second was that they accepted the Roman emperor as their king and not Jesus. We read in John chapter 19, verse 15, but they cried out, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So instead of the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, Jesus, they accepted the king of violence, Rome, Caesar, as their own, and thus the judgment came. And then the third reason was that they had, had put a self-imposed curse upon themselves rather than accepting Jesus as their king and the blessing that would come with that. For in Matthew chapter 27, verse 25 says, then answered all the people and said, his blood be upon us and our children. Oh, it was terrible. Again, I want to reiterate that the judgment was on that particular generation, and it's not continuing to this day here. So Jesus prophesied when he sat on the Mount of Olives and he looked over Jerusalem and he wept and he said these words. When he had come near and beheld the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou had only known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belongeth unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemy shall cast a trench upon thee, about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. In other words, Jesus was saying, for not realizing that the promise of the coming of the Messiah had taken place, him and their failure has resulted in this horrible occasion as reflected in Psalm 94 here. Well, let's move on to the next Psalm here, and this is on Thursday, Psalm 81. Psalm 81. Now, this is a Psalm that's primarily sung during the Feast of Tabernacles that, that we had talked a little bit about, whereas it is supposed to be a joyous time. You know, the Feast of Tabernacle was really a, a festival, a ritual of the anticipation of the Messianic kingdom. So it's the last of the seven observances that God uh, had given to the nation of Israel, starting with Passover in the spring and then culminating, ending in the fall with the Feast of Tabernacle. And of course, this was a great time. I mean, it was joyful. There was singing and there was food and there was all kinds of great merriment of all kinds. And they observed it for each seven days there. And each day they anticipated that the Messiah was suddenly appear was suddenly come this was something that was anticipated as they observed all their festivals and as they went through all their uh, rituals the sacrifices and as they sang these songs that they always felt that what they were doing in ritual form in a type in a shadow that they recognized that the messiah would suddenly appear would suddenly come and make it come into a, a reality and so with the feast of tabernacle being the last of the seven feasts uh, and then with all the merriment connected with it, you can imagine uh, the uh, the excitement and the anticipation connected with it. But when Jesus was there, as recorded in John chapter 789, it was not a joyful occasion. 
The psalmist is saying to the people, your rejoicing is that you need to remember the past. That's what Psalm 81 is saying. In your rejoicing, you got to remember the past, where you came from, and then where we are now, and then what was anticipated or what could have been. And that's what we're going to look at here, and we're going to see it prophetically in reference to the person of Jesus when he was here. First of all, verses 1 through 10 of Psalm 81 basically points out the things that were. You called in trouble, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Now, as this is what the psalmist is saying to the people during this time, that with the rejoicing, remember where we were, where you were. You were in trouble, and I delivered you. That's the story of the Exodus. You know, Egypt, the, what happened there when they were slaves. And then the place where God spoke to them, the place of thunder, the Mount Sinai, when the law was given, when God showed his might, his glory, that he is the true and living God, and how he had destroyed Israel's enemies, uh, Pharaoh and his Egyptian army that pursued them. And then how he provided water for them in the desert. Remember that it is God who made these things possible. That's what the first thing we read here. And then we read the second point. Oh, let me, maybe, maybe I should just bring in, in reference to Jesus' time here, how that kind of relates here. As Jesus was teaching at the temple at this time, he told the people that all who would believe in him would receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. One of the exciting rituals connected with the Feast of Tabernacle is water, the refreshment. It was water that provided life. Uh, and there's a ritual where the priest would gather, uh, take some of the water from the pool of Salom, bring it up to the temple and pour it into these funnels at the great altar. And there the people would sing as they would wave their palm branches and they would recognize that without that water, Jerusalem would cease, you know, that, and that water just kind of came from an aquifer, you know, it just kind of bubbled up every 30 minutes or so. And so Jesus there would have said that, you know, anyone who... Uh, is thirsty partake of him because he is the giver of life he's the giver of refreshment he is the giver of the holy spirit and then jesus's enemies of course uh if they had kept his word they would have then recognized that uh, the judgment that eventually did come uh, wouldn't have happened as such so let's look at the second uh, feature 11 and 12 of psalm 81 the things that are happening the psalmist says but my people would not heed my voice and Israel would not have none of me. They would have none of me. Well, in Jesus' day, some of the religious leaders sought to kill him. This is what we read in John chapter 7. And then also they sought to arrest him as well, too. And then in John chapter 8, verse 41, it says that they alleged that Jesus' birth was illegitimate. That's a serious, serious accusation because in this day, People's lineage meant a lot because it kind of uh, vindicated the positions and the offices that you had. But to question that was to challenge your entire line, your entire right, and, and all that you're entitled to. So it was a very, very serious charge. And because of that, God brought judgment upon that generation that, uh, of Jesus' day. And then the third feature is in verses 13 through 16. The things that might have been, the psalmist says, oh, that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. Wow. John chapter 8, verse 12 makes very clear at the end of the seven day observance that Jesus said that he was the light of the world. Still, many did not believe in him. And so they continued in the spiritual darkness and the judgment that eventually had come upon them. Let's look on to Friday, Psalm 93 here, Psalm 93. Now, when you look at the history of Israel, uh, you don't really see them as seafarers. Uh, they pretty much were people of the land. You know, they recognized this was the promised land and that's their home. That's where they stayed. They didn't need to go traveling out. Uh, elsewhere so they were not known as seafarers and because of that the sea uh appeared very alienish and and threatening they had believed that the, the sea was sort of like a reservoir of uh, evil forces 
I mean, the Philistines came over and all these people who came and conquered them and invaded them always came, you know, uh, some came through the sea and other, and other places as well. The Canaanites, uh, they had a belief system in which Baal, which was one of their chief gods here, uh, had overcome the sea god. And so Baal controlled the sea. And so the sea became known as the home of uh, of all bad things, <laughs> even the terrible Leviathan, you know, that terrible dragon that's recorded in scripture uh, comes out of the sea. Uh, you know, he, he symbolizes pagan uh, nations that opposed Israel. Uh, so again, all that to say that the, the Jewish folks, uh, that crazy seafarers, they're not that way there. Now in Psalm 93, uh, what we have here is uh, an attack uh by god of baalism you know the things that uh, are related to the enemies of israel and because only the lord god has authority to subdue the sea now of course i think perhaps you are aware we're going to look at a particular incident here in uh first psalm 93 verse 3 4 says the floods have lifted up O lord the floods have lifted up their voices. The floods lift up their voice, waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. Yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Okay. Well, on one occasion, Jesus entered into a boat and, uh, and a storm came. Now, he knew there was going to be a storm. I mean, he's omniscient. He's God in the flesh. He knows all things here. But to instruct his disciples and because it's recorded in the word of God to give us confidence and hope uh, he got on this boat and a storm took place so we read in Matthew chapter 8 verse 23 through 27 and when he was entered into a ship his disciples followed him and behold there arose a great tempest in the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves but he was asleep hmm, he was asleep and his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men, the disciples, those who were out in the ship boat there, marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, I think that should be fairly easy. He's the Lord God. You know, something that I think that we can learn from this whole incident here is that the Lord never promised that we will never experience storms in our life. I think we're all aware of that. But he said that we are to expect troubles. But he did promise that he will not leave us nor forsake us when we're facing our troubles or our storms. He will never leave us in the midst of our troubles here. For we read in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulations. You're going to have problems. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Again, so much wonderful truths that can come out of Psalm 93, as all the Psalms here of the day. And you can imagine as the priest stood on those steps and they sang and they sang these psalms and the people would hear them uh, each day of the week, if as frequently as they had visited the temple, that some of these truths would have come to their hearts, to their minds, that God would have instilled in them an awareness and an understanding and how precious it would have been for all of them to have seen, to have heard and to appreciate what the Lord was saying. OK, now we come to Saturday. Saturday is Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Now, this is the only psalm that is specifically titled, this is the song for the Sabbath, the Sabbath day psalm. Okay. Its focus is on the worship of God, of course, and the works that he had done. And of course, of the, the rest, the spiritual rest that comes as a result, that assurance. You know, when they rested in ancient times, it was like at home, they reclined. It was a symbol, it was a representation of one at home, at peace, that all is well. Now, some Jewish writers, as they looked at this particular psalm, they recognized that this was really the, uh, the, the picture 
of the Messianic kingdom, which would be a thousand year Sabbath rest. <laughs> you know, there. The Sabbath, of course, as uh, observed by many of our Jewish friends, is a time to set aside the cares and the affairs of the world and to focus on the word and God's goodness and his presence in his midst. You can always go back to work, but that Sabbath was special where they would just be together with family and with friends and they would partake of a meal together, but they would recognize that it is the rest that is anticipated that only the Lord can really provide in a person's life and soul. And so we read these words in Psalm 92, verse 1 and 2. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. When we look at the person of Jesus, he's the only one that can really bring that rest to the heart of a troubled, anxious soul. He's the one that can provide that perfect Sabbath. For so we can read in John chapter 6, verse 29, uh, 28, 29, which states, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. That you believe on him whom he has sent. You see, the key to understanding how Jesus is our Sabbath rest is to understand the word Sabbath, which means to rest, to rest. God's rest is a spirit, it's in the spiritual realm here. It provides an eternal rest of salvation through what he had accomplished there at Calvary's cross with his broken body, his shed blood, dying on the cross for our sins, bearing our sins upon himself. Faith is that key that enters us or gives us that entrance into his perfect rest. There's no other sa Sabbath rest that's real than the one that he alone can provide. That's why we can always good to give thanks because it's a reasonable service when you really take it to heart what he actually was willing to do for you and for me. He provides that eternal shalom, which causes us to give thanks and to sing his praises. Uh, again, there's so many wonderful things that can be said here, but let's close out our thoughts here. And let me share something here that I trust will be a blessing to you as well. In the late 1940s into the 1950s, Nearly 950 ancient Hebrew religious manuscripts were discovered at a place called Qumran in Israel. They are commonly referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was truly a great archaeological discovery and find for sure. But you know what is amazing? That that group that was there living there at that time, uh, who was basically writing and storing these scrolls there, uh, they were extremely devoted to the worship of God. That was their main focus. And so it's any, is it any wonder that over a hundred Psalm manuscripts and portions of the Psalms were found, making it the most of any of the biblical books discovered. Number one was always the Psalms was the most that they had there. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, knew the Psalms by heart. He would have sung them. He would have heard them. He would have quoted them off it because when you read the four Gospels, you know what's most quoted from the Old Testament? The book of Psalms. It comes from there. Because there you have everything of God's program laid out. So because of his death, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension, all that, he has redeemed us. And that gives us occasion to worship him and then to shout these wonderful words. Baruch haba by Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, I'm going to end here, and I trust that uh, you would take the time to read these Psalms in its entirety and look at the various verses there and meditate upon them and pray and just ask the Lord to show you what they would mean in its application in your own life. And I trust and pray that this uh, will be a great source for you. Until we meet again, God bless each and every one of you. Shalom. Shalom.